So when I was eight years old, I really, really, really wanted a puppy. And every time I'd ask my parents or my grandparents or my great-grandparents, they would all say the same thing. You're not old enough to have one. You won't take care of it and yada, yada. So I went in my room. I closed the door. I said, God, I declare, I affirm, I know what I need. I might not have used at eight years old the word declare, but I was declaring. And I was like, you know what I need? I need a puppy. I need a dog. Like, just to survive in this world, bring it on. A couple of weeks later, we live way out in the country. We live very, very few people live near us. A couple of weeks later, here comes this puppy up on the doorsteps. And my parents go, where did that come from? How did you get that? And I said, God sent the puppy to me. I understood early on, you use God behind you. And no one is going to argue with you. Am I right? You use God with you, and no one is going to argue with you. But the deeper lesson that I learned then, there's a big difference between human law and spiritual law. There's, that's why we call ourselves metaphysical people. It means beyond the physical. It means that we don't go by what we see often. We go by what we don't see, and we call it into our lives. We bring it into that energy field, yes? yes. You know, I, I did a talk one time called uh, Life Without a Zip Code. And I, I realize in deepening the awareness of life that you can put together the most beautiful package in the world to send somewhere throughout the world. You can address the, the greatest Hallmark card or draw your own. But if you send that out without a zip code, more than likely it's never going to arrive at its destination. Am I right? It's going to go in la-la land. And that's what happens often in, in a, this metaphysical world that we live in is we, we believe, we claim, we know, but we're not going by our soul code. We're not going by our zip code to understand what we need to call in for our self-actualizing being. We're not aligning. We're doing too much people-pleasing. We're, we're going with the trends. We're going with what people say is popular right now. Versus what do you want to call out within your own life right here and right now? We talked last week, we're talking this week and the following week on being a leader in the unity teaching. Being a leader and standing in the, in the forefront of change. And if ever there was a time for us to shine, it's now. We have to accept metaphysically that this is why we're here, and this is what we are to do, is to lead people over and beyond traditional religiosity and other faiths. We are here to take the forefront of this movement. Are you with me? Is that something that you are willing to be part of? We are no longer an apology. We are here to make a mighty noise. You know, someday is not a day of the week. Someday is not a day of the week. And we're not here for someday. We're here for now day. We're here for this moment here. And to claim the movement and the energy and the feeling. And that is how we're able to be in unity is the very nature of who we are and what we face. And how we show up shows what unity is. If you're telling someone what unity is, then you're not showing it. Because if you're showing it, you don't need to tell somebody. And, and let's keep putting off, stop putting off, let's stop saying someday and claim in a, in a more powerful way right now. I was so moved. I've been away this past week. I've been on retreat. And I've discovered my, my new friend. She is Amy Simple McPherson. And she... In the in 1910 and 1920s, she was the most known, most famous person in the world. She built Angelus Temple in Los Angeles in 1923. Okay? And she's the one that really put the Pentecostal movement on the map. 
But she would show up with her children and her tent, and thousands of people would come in. One time she put up her tent, and from 25 states, people drove to hear her talk. You don't think she had to be brave and bold? You don't think she had to be metaphysical in her awareness of doing something that no one had ever done before? And she really wanted to build this temple. By the way, she loved St. Petersburg. It was one of her favorites, just saying. <laughs> For those of you tuning in, that's where we broadcast from. But she loved Tampa Bay and St. Petersburg. And she got it in her heart to build this temple. There was only one larger sanctuary, and it was in London. And she wanted to build one for 5,400. She said God told her to do that. How are you? When God tells you to do something, do you apologize for it? Do you stand in it and say, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen because God told me it's going to happen? Are we brave enough? Do we step forward enough, you see? So a group of people gathered when the land was there, and she said, well, I have $5,000. How much, how much would it, you know, could you do for $5,000? Which I'm sure in 1923 was a lot more money than it sounds. And they said, well, that'd dig the hole. Well, you know what most people would have said? Well, someday maybe we'll be able to do it, right? You know what most people would say? Well, never mind. We'll, we'll just keep doing a lot more work till we get it. No. She said, dig the hole. Dig the hole and the rest will come. Say that with me. Dig the hole and the rest will come. Dig the hole with your commitment and your belief system and the rest it will show up. You know, as Reverend Christie said so beautifully, we believe in the one power, that one immutable, that energetic, that infinite power that we call God. We do not entertain a boogeyman or a man in a red suit. When things don't go well, we don't blame another energy that we call the devil. We are co-creating with God, as we talked about last week. We're not blaming anyone else. But in our humanity, we do have a shadow. And we want to be aware of our shadow. And as leaders of this movement, we need to be aware of what the shadow is within our movement in New Thought. It's mediocrity. It's settling when we don't need to settle. It's apologizing when we need to be bold and step forward. We do not need to be mediocre. That's why in the 1900s, people were craving someone to talk because they didn't say, oh, we have big dreams, but if they don't happen, it's okay. We're still special, and it's all in divine order. No, they declared, they commanded God, bring it on. I'm going to stand here until it comes. And the leaders, Emmett Fox and Eric Butterworth and all the greats, Raymond Charles Barker had thousands of people coming. Why? Because they taught people you don't have to be mediocre. You can be rich during the depression. You can be healed of your ailment. You can be cured. You can manifest because that's what we are. We're metaphysical people. They would stand bold and brave in that energetic field. When I first started here in 2003, I was called into the ICU. One of our members, uh, Miss Ella Moorhead, this is a public story, so she doesn't mind. I've told it a couple of times in the 17 years, but she called me into ICU because her son was 44. He had severe diabetes, and they said... He's, sorry, Miss Moorhead, he, he's not going to make it. Things are already starting to shut down. So I walk in the room, and he, I'm, you know, the wires were everywhere. Noises were, you know, all around. I'd never met the man in my life. His eyes are closed. He's kind of half there. And I go into the room, and I start affirming, and I just open up my heart. What, do you, what God needs to be said here? What do I need to say here? I said, yes, on behalf of his name, I ask for forgiveness. He's been taking his life for granted. He hasn't been exercising the value of what you have given him, of the life force and that energetic presence. And he has been playing around with this idea 
And many times people have told him what to do, and he thinks it's a joke. Well, it's not funny now, God. And we're asking you that he forgive himself and release all guilt and release all shame and step into this life force right now. And we affirm for him that he will do better. And the magic of life will come through him. All of a sudden, he starts wailing. He starts coughing. And he said, I have been taking my life for granted. I will never do it again. In two and a half weeks, he had on a brand new suit, and he drove himself to this church. Yes, he did. That is the, that is the power, and that is the grace and that is the strength and the being bold that we're calling forth now in this movement. Because it either needs to start moving or we need to go be something else. Because we are not here to shine mediocrity. It's not what our forefathers, our foremothers, our fore everyone did. They stood in a place that said, let's command it. Let's bring it on. Right? Right? And so, in that energy, I was watching an interview with um, Tyler Perry. He, he made it to billionaire status this year. And they were asking him, you know, what, what's one of the secrets? And he said, well, I don't think there is a secret. I just stopped aligning with my parents and with those old belief systems. And I started realizing that that was the reason I was created was to be great. And there was no other answer. But I, I was supposed to be great, and I was destined for greatness. It was a promise made to me by God, as made with everybody. And the only one that was settling was myself, he said. So I decided to step into that and say, I hear you, God, and I accept my greatness. Say it with me. I hear you, God, and I accept my greatness. And he said, I just stood into that, and I owned it. And I, I became it, and I started living it, and there you go. The rest is history in many, many ways, right? You see, a flashlight doesn't do any good if it just stays in the drawer. It, it doesn't do any good if it just stays in the drawer. It has no use whatsoever. And when you are walking through what you don't know, and you're walking through things that you can't see, it likens me of years ago when I used to guard the colonel's house in the army at 4.30 in the morning. Never really understood why I was needing to do that, but they never asked me if I wanted to. They just told me that's what I would be doing. But when I would be walking through the dark and I'd put that flashlight too far ahead, I couldn't see a thing. And so many people do that. They try to see so ahead of where things are, you see, that they just become blinded by the unknown and the mediocrity and the, what they can't see. But all you got to do is just put it two steps, right? Like our buddy, Sister Amy said, just dig the hole. Do the first thing and then do the next thing. And that's where we want to be as visionaries. Don't try to think too far ahead. Just declare what you know you want to see in your life. And you will see it. And you will see it many, many, many times over. Does this work for you? Are you resonating with what I'm talking about? Because God will speak to you through opportunities and from experiences and from, from dreams. A couple of years ago, my beloved shaman teacher was in the midst of making her transition, and I could, I could feel it, that it was just a matter of days. I just intuitively knew it, and I just started talking to her soul and communicating. And I knew that the next step was going to be hospice. And so on Tuesday, I, I had a dream. I had a dream, and I saw her, and I saw the gurney. I saw them taking her out of her beloved home where lives had been touched, where people had discovered who they were, where it was her precious place that she had, had built with her hands and her, all of her love. And I could see her looking back 
looking back as they were taking her to hospice. And she was so sad and weary, and the life force was just coming out of her body. Wow, what a dream. And then on Thursday, before we had to have hospice come, she had died. And I'm there, and I'm in her bedroom, and I'm talking to her. And then we called hours later for the people to come and pick her up. And there she was on the gurney. And someone said to me, is this sad for you? I, I, I imagine you would be crying a whole lot. I said, God gave me a dream. And showed me what it would be like if her natural transition had been interrupted. I am not sad at all because she has gone lovingly to her next destination. In your spiritual metaphysical life, you will have dreams many times over that will give you clues and help you with the next steps of what is to be. I love how our team is always on the same page, even though we don't talk about what we're going to say. But Harriet Tubman said, you know, I saved a lot of slaves, but I would have saved a lot more people if they had known they were slaves. I, I ask you today, I'm asking myself this, where are you mediocre? Where have you settled? Where have you bought into statistics and human law and excuses and all this stuff? Where are you settling in your life? And, and why? And why? When you can command the greatness to come in. When you can command the greatness. Let's look at that as a community. Why are we settling for any mediocrity when we can have everything to spread the wonderful teaching of what we believe in? Everyone in the world needs what we have to offer in this teaching. And let's hold that and put that in your prayer work. Put that in your knowing. Put that in your belief system. So many people before us, they really had to be brave. We just need to be out loud. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We just need to be out loud for sure. <clears throat> One of our staff members had a problem with her arm and her shoulder. And of course the specialist wanted to do surgery. But it had, was really preventing her from doing what she wanted to do and playing golf and, and, and doing all these things. And she showed me one day, she said, look, this is as far as I can you know, raise my arm. So she went to see someone here in the city and he said, certain muscles, you, you just need your muscles to be stretched. And so he stretched her muscles. And she came in the next morning. She said, look, look what I can do. I thought she was going to lift me in the air. Look what I can do. Look, I can move. I, can, I have no hesitation. Look, I can get back to my life. All we had to do was restretch those muscles. Look at me. And that's what we got to do, people. We got to restretch those muscles. You know, watch these messages. Listen to this music. Listen to our teachers. More than one time, more than one time. And allow yourself to hear it in different ways many times over because we got to stretch to where we haven't gone before. Because if we want different, we got to do different. If we want different, we got to express different. Am I right? Yeah. Because we are here to have this abundant life. I'm going to close with this wonderful story. Our former administrator. She and her husband went to Hawaii, and so she came over on a Friday, and she was telling me all about it, Maui, and the experiences, and I said, explain to me everywhere you went. I really want to feel it, you know, for you, and um, so she explained everything to me, and it just sounded like just a beautiful experience that she had had. So on Monday, I was doing a call on my computer, a Skype call, and you know how Outlook will pop up your emails? And on Outlook, it said, Reverend Temple, would you want to come to Hawaii? In the subject line. And I couldn't wait to get off that call. <laughs> uh, and I click it, and it says, Reverend Temple, 
we somehow have overextended our student base here in the Pacific Rim, and we find ourselves without a teacher for the week. And we would love to fly you here, all expenses paid, provide you with a car, whatever you need. And I, I wrote them and I said, you know, my initial response is to say yes, but I don't want to just work the whole time I'm there. That's no fun. Been there and done that. Don't do that anymore. No problem. You can stay as many weeks as you want to stay. You have an automobile. You have an apartment. You just make yourself at home and enjoy the space. Anything is possible when you are talking about the abundant living that we call God. Thank you so much.